At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, new customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I'm coming into you with another FHD Vault episode for you on this September 21st of 2022. Not too long ago on Saturday, you heard the uh, reincarnation of the NFL 100 episode, and in that, we talked a little bit about some original NFL teams. However, my Detroit Lions were not there. But then on Sunday, we proceeded to dominate the Washington Commanders. Well, for the majority of the game. I always said if we could put three quarters together, we're going to be okay. Until we play against a real team, that is. We're going to need to put four full quarters together if we're ever going to want to hoist the Lombardi Trophy. But I tell you, around these parts, we are sure sipping on that Honolulu Blue and Silver Kool-Aid. So what better way than to have an FHD Vault episode when we're still riding high than to talk to somebody that actually was there and played the last time the Lions won the NFL championship, albeit it was 1957 and that was way long ago. But we won't even talk about how long ago it was and that they don't have a Super Bowl under their belt. What we're going to do is we're going to talk to this week's guest. Well, I mean. (laughs) <laughs> we're not going to talk to him this week. We're going to replay when I talk to Mr. Gene Cronin. On December 17, 1933, the Chicago Bears hosted the New York Giants at Wrigley Field in Chicago, Illinois in the NFL's inaugural championship game. This was on the back of the 1932 unplanned first ever playoff game between the Chicago Bears and the Portsmouth Spartans, later to be moved to the Motor City and become the Detroit Lions. But curiously enough, the hero of this episode was also born in 1933, and he knows a little bit about Detroit and championships, which admittedly, you have to go way back to pronounce those two words in the same sentence. That's what we do in this episode. We're going to go way back to the last time the Lions won a championship game, and this is going to be with the man that lived it. And it all revolved around 19. 57. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This week, as we step off the DeLorean, we find ourselves in a winter wonderland. Or at least it's winter wonderland for yours truly on this current timeline, Christmas Day. I mean, the date is actually December 29th, 1957. Because we are in Briggs Stadium in downtown Detroit, Michigan. I mean, you ask yourself, why would you freeze your buns off? You don't like the cold. You want to wear shorts. Well, that's easy. The reason why we're here on December 29th of 1957 in Briggs Stadium, is because we're here to witness the last time that the Detroit Lions won an NFL championship game. And it's Christmas Day when this episode releases, so yours truly had to give himself a little Christmas gift considering the current timeline in his Detroit Lions. But I do have a guest riding shotgun with this, and this time, we're going to have Gene Cronin. You might not have heard of this name before, but he's what you will call a primary witness for the 1957 championship game. The reason? He played for those very Detroit Lions. Now, mind you, this is against Jim Brown, 
in his rookie year, so he had the pleasure or displeasure of trying to slow down that big running back. The great one, Jim Brown. Mr. Cronin was also drafted and played in the very first season for the Dallas Cowboys. He then was traded to Washington for a bit before heading back to Detroit to become a scout. Rounding out his NFL career as the first ever director of player personnel for the newly formed Atlanta Falcons. I'll leave some good links in the show notes for you to learn more about Gene and the 1957 Detroit Lions championship team. Which, by the way, you can get to the show notes to your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes we'll each and every week. But enough of this. Waiting around. This is Christmas Day. Let's get down to business. Let's talk to Gene Cronin. How did you get drafted to become a Detroit Lion? Well, I was in the 1956 draft. I was a seventh round draft by the Detroit Lions. Uh, where did you go to school, to college? College of the Pacific, now the University of Pacific in Stockton, California. Now, what got you into football? What, what, what was your major drive? I played in high school and college. Loved it. What was your first experience playing football? In McClatchy High School in Sacramento, California. And then after you left college, you went into, you got drafted by the Detroit Lions and you were drafted in 56 draft and then the 57 season came around. What was the uh, the fondest memory of the 1957 season? Well, winning the championship. That's, a, that's the best you can get. <laughs> that's right. And that's their last championship that they've won. That is. Um, do you remember any specific moments from that season? Well, of course, we uh, came from behind and two or three games to win. We we had great team. We had uh, never give up. Played it all. Had great teammates. Which uh, teammate do you remember the most? All of them. I wouldn't want to leave them. I wouldn't want to leave somebody out. I totally respect that, sir. Uh, what about your coach, George Wilson? What What were some of because that was his rookie year, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, What was he like? You couldn't ask for a better coach. See, he played in the league. He knew what it was like. He knew what we were going through. He knew when to call practice over. And he was, he was great. He was a, he was a player's coach. You said when he, uh, he knew when to call practice over. By that, what, what do you mean? And blew the whistle. Practice was over. Go on in. <laughs> sure, sure. And um, when you were in the NFL, did you actually have a? Uh, did you have to take another job as well, or was the NFL your only source of income? Well, my first two years, I went back to college and did graduate work. I did two years of graduate work, and then my third year, I think I just, I don't think I had it. A full-time job for six months. I just didn't do that. I came back and helped out around the house and stuff like that. Okay, and what position did you play? I played defensive end and outside linebacker. So that was during the time of Bart Starr, Johnny Unitas, and some other great quarterbacks in the history of the game. What was it like chasing those guys around? They were the best. You hit it on the head, uh, of course, we had two of the best, too. Mm-hmm. And that season, didn't you go through uh, both of the quarterbacks played for the Lions? Yes, what they did was that alternate. What kind of advantage did you think you gained from that? We got the job done. <laughs> and what about Jim Brown? Did you ever have a chance to try to tackle him? Now, that's not a smart question. <laughs> no. What do you mean, try to tackle <laughs> yeah uh, okay so did you ever play did you face against him on the same field i didn't know if you ever were on the same field at the same time 1957 was his rookie year that was the year of the championship game when we played the browns for the championship 
he was a big running back. And Jim Brown was, uh, he was the most physical runner and he had everything. He was uh, big and strong, but yet he had great speed. Now, the game plan, one of them, defensively, you're never going to stop Jim Brown. But the game plan was you take the long gainers away from him. You don't let him get off on those 30, 40, 50, 60-yard touchdown runs. And we did that. Yeah, and obviously you guys won the championship, and it was the last one for the Detroit Lions. And I'm a Detroit Lions fan myself. I've never seen them really win anything in my lifetime. You weren't you weren't around for the '57 champ. You're you're too young. Yes, sir, I am. I'm I'm only 34 years old. My grandpa was born in 1930, so he was able to live that time. And I talked to him sometimes about the World War II era, what it was like growing up. What were your experiences growing up during the uh, the World War II era? It was deep. I had three brothers in World War II. They all were in the thick of it, and they all came home. And then, and then I had a brother in the Korean War, and he was in the thick of it, and he came home. So all four of my brothers, they were in the thick of the wars. Uh, Second War and the Korean War, and they all came home. Yeah, I'm glad they were able to come home. That's something that I myself cannot even imagine living through. Well, as I look back, the one that I look back on that had it tough was my mother and father. They, We said the rosary about every night, and uh, they came home, and that's what counted. And they were all successful in life after I came home. Did any of them play football as well or any other sports? No, they, in fact, my brother Bob and my brother Bill, my, they joined when they were 17. My father had to sign them in because they were under 18. Oh, wow. Well, going back to your career with the Lions, do you have a most memorable moment other than the 57 championship? Every Sunday was memorable. You know, we, one thing about the Lions, we, we got ready for the game. We had, we had great players. They had, it was, it was great. I'll just say that. <laughs> we had great, had great teammates. Sure, sure. And what about the fans of Detroit during the 50s? What were they like? They were the best. They were the best. One of the best, darnest thing I ever saw in my life. In that championship year, 57, we had to play the 49ers in a playoff game. We were tied at the end of the season, and we had to play the 49ers in San Francisco at Kizar Stadium. And uh, the 49ers were ahead of us 24 to 7 at halftime, and uh, locker rooms were side by side, and they were beating on the wall and yelling all kinds of things. and. Coach Wilson stood up and said, I was going to say something, but that's what they think of you. And he sat down. So we went out and uh, we won. We came back in the second half. They were ahead of us 24 to 7 at halftime. Then they kicked a field goal and it was 27 to 7. And we ended up beating them 31 to 27. But when we got home, we flew home. And then the next day, it was Tuesday, I think it was, Monday or Tuesday. I went down to the office, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I looked out my car window, and there was a line of people out the front door, two abreast, all the way around the block. You know why? Why is that? General admission tickets were going on sale. Ah. They, I saw those 400 gallon with a 500, four 500 gallon drums with stick up, uh, popes, uh, posts sticking out of them on fire, people trying to get warm. It went clear around the building. General admission tickets went on sale, and those people were there all day and night. Now, you talk about great fans. That's great. Yeah, and that was at Briggs Stadium at the time, wasn't it? 
That was Briggs Stadium. Did you live pretty close to the stadium when you were playing? I lived downtown most of my career. What was downtown like back in the 50s compared to now? It was great. And then after your after your Detroit Lions career, you moved you were one of the first linebackers for the Dallas Cowboys, weren't you, during the expansion year? Well, I played mostly defensive end, but I played linebacker too. No, we had some pretty good people. Okay, and then you 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 went back to Detroit after your career as a player to be a scout. What 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 drove you to do that? Well, they had a position and I took it. <laughs> so did you have any prior experience or was it just because you were a player and you were in the game for so long? I don't know. That those those decisions are made in the front office. Oh, okay. And then after being a scout, you were the first director of player personnel for the Falcons during their first year. How did that go? That was wonderful. We, uh, I loved Atlanta. It was a great city, and uh, our number one draft choice was Tommy Nobis, All American out of University of Texas, and he uh, he's deceased now. But he was not only a great player; he was a great person. And what what ultimately made you decide to select him as your number one overall? Because I believed in defense. Not, I didn't neglect offense, but uh, you need uh, you need good linebackers. You need good everything, linemen and everything. He was all American. I watched him play college ball. And he was the guy you wanted in the middle. What was it like? Because that was during the AFL, like right in the middle of it. What was it like drafting against the AFL at that time? I don't look at things like that. You draft, you get the job done, or or you lose. We never lost a player. Oh, really? No. no. How long did you stick around with the Atlanta Falcons? I was there about four or five years. And then was that the end of your NFL career, or did you do move on? Yeah, and I, I had a great time. I loved it. Today's players are, you know, that that's it's a little bit different type of play nowadays with the the way the rules are. What do you think is the biggest change between when you played to today's rules? I don't even know the rules. <laughs> okay, all right, sir. Uh, I mean, I knew um, a penalty was a penalty. Do you think that? If you played today, it would be different than if you played back then. I had uh, I had great teammates, and uh, when we showed up on Sunday, we showed up to play. That was uh, we had good camaraderie. It was a different era than it is now. In my high school, college, and pro career, it's a different era, and you know we took care of each other. If you miss with one of us, you miss with all of us. And I would guess that uh, my rookie, my my especially rookie career, that that uh, I would guess that eighty percent of the team was married and had children. When somebody's child got sick, the rest of the wives were right there to do whatever needed to be done. And and uh, the team, if somebody missed with one, they missed with all of us. It was great camaraderie. We had it. Well, there you go. You mess with one and you mess with them all. And speaking of messing with Gene Cronin, well, I hope that you enjoyed this blast from the past to learn about what football was really like back in the late 50s and early 60s. I think the coolest gridiron knowledge nugget myself was when he talked about that halftime game of the 49ers and he was sitting there and they're all getting rowdy across the wall because they're up on him 27 to 7 or whatever it was and the coach gets up, he's like, I was going to give you a speech, but you know what they think of you. He sits down, and that was all they needed, all the motivation that the Detroit Lions needed to beat those 49ers, to come back, to come to Detroit City to play in the 1957 championship game. I mean, where else are you going to hear that stuff? Well, I guess you can hear it on the Football History Dude podcast, and if you think that someone else would like to listen to this or any of the other shows, well, I'll tell you what. Please share this link with them send them over to thefootballhistorydude.com. But let's shift into next week. We're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about another original NFL team. But we're going to go ahead and stick with the Motor City. We're going to talk about the Detroit Heralds. But for now, dudes, 
I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. Put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand. And that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices, doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect. Ah, that's a nice one. College football, 1923, Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. Wilson certainly was great On the next kickoff, who would end up as returner? But Harry Wilson. Wilson dodged at least a half dozen. Recall the greatest moment in sports history, or just your own personal favorite, with Row One Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. Sports Friday. Coming soon. Remain Penn State 14 0 half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.